Hi, I'm Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and this is part 3 of my Who is Elrond law and character study video covering the beginning of the third age, mostly from Elrond's perspective. I will split the complete third age section into several parts and when everything is done release an all in one video. I already covered the first and second age in a lot of detail, almost 5 hours of content. Feel free to check those out as well, links are in the description. You don't have to watch the other videos to understand this one though. When people think of the War of the Last Alliance of Elves and Men, they think of an epic battle and great victory against the second Dark Lord Sauron at the end of the Second Age. But those who were there might see this differently. Elrond compares it to the War of Rath, the great war that ended the First Age, also called Elder Days. He concluded in the Council of Elrond, it recalled to me the glory of the Elder Days and the hosts of Beleriand. So many great princes and captains were assembled, and yet not so many nor so fair as when Thangorodrim was broken and the elves deemed that evil was ended forever and it was not so. I have seen three ages in the west of the world and many defeats and many fruitless victories. I often think about if the last sentence includes the War of the Last Alliance or not because, as we learned in the Second Age part, the victory was expensive. Elrond at least says not wholly so in Lord of the Rings. In some of Tolkien's work in progress versions of these events, we find details that clearly show how the evil of the first Dark Lord Morgos, which is Sauron's former master, still unfolded its power thousands of years later. The conflicts between some of the elven clans that were induced by Morgos were still present at the end of the Second Age and led to the deaths of many of them, for example King Amdir of Los Lorien and King Orofer, Thranduil's father, at least if you see those characters as canon. In this version of these events, these two kings would not want to be under the command of a Noldor king, Gilgalad in this case, and decided to do their own thing in battle, causing some chaos and charging without support into the enemy. Ultimately, they were driven into the marshes nearby and perished there. These would be later known as the Dead Marshes. Many other great names of history were slain in the war as well. Gilgalad himself, Elendil and his son Anarion, they all died. But the most bitter part was that in the end Isildur took the One Ring as quote, were guilt for my father and my brother, against the advice of Elrond and Círdan. The One Ring was not undone and its evil and Sauron's power or one could say the fate Sauron has wrought for Middle-earth remained in the world. It could have ended here but it did not. And as we know every decision has its consequences. It's hard to say how much influence the One Ring which contains Sauron's will and power had over Isildur in these moments but it for sure had influence. And in a way it's not surprising that it was not destroyed. No mortal and not even an elf could have done it. Even Frodo fails in the end and it's as Tolkien explained in letter 192 a higher power, Eru or God, that took over at the end resulting in Gollum who broke his oath to Frodo as well falling into the fires of Mount Doom. Tolkien explains few others, possibly no others of his time would have got so far. And I think here lies a lot of truth. No mortal man and no elf would have been able to destroy the ring. In a way it's almost unfair for Isildur. Sometimes I see the question why Elrond did not take the one ring away from Isildur and destroyed it himself. He could not have done it either and he knew that, which shows his wisdom. Elrond has seen the rise and fall of Eregion and fought against Sauron before. He also knew how Sauron would try to control others. Isildur also might have thought, what evil can such a small trinket cause? That is a big part of what we will discuss in this video today and the parts to come. At the beginning of part 1 I talked about things Elrond was known for. Elrond is a survivor. 
lawmaster, leader and commander, advisor, one of the wise and a healer. We covered those already in the parts behind us. In this third age section of these Who is Elrond videos, we will learn more about him as lawmaster, scholar, one of the wise, healer, husband, father, about his hospitality, but also about great tragedy in his life and the sacrifices he had to make, but also about many of the great events from the third age. As always, and you probably already noticed, I try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it, which means that you have to embrace the trilled R. Shoutouts again to all the artists who allowed me to use their fantastic artworks. Kimberly 80, Ted Nasmith, Sara Morello, Jenny Dolphin, Niati, Benef, Laura Tolton, Pete Macri, Andres Bertaccini and Firat Solhan. Links are in the description. Also, spoiler warning and keep in mind that I wrote this script before The Nature of Middle-earth released in September 2021. I tried to update the script but it's maybe not as consequent as it could have been otherwise. Also, all parts were planned to be one big video originally but as said the parts also work on their own. But let's continue with what happened after Sauron's defeat which ended the Second Age and started the Third Age. After the siege of Sauron's dark forge with Barad-dûr at the end of the War of the Last Alliance of Elves and Men, Isildur was one of the few remaining survivors of the faithful Dúnedain lords, so the men of the west, who escaped the downfall of the island Númenor. I should mention that after this downfall his father, his brother and him became kings of the Dúnedain in exile, founding the kingdoms Arnor in the north and Gondor in the south, but after the War of the Last Alliance, Isildur's father, who was the High King of Arnor and Gondor, was dead. He and his brother Anarion ruled together over Gondor as kings, but Anarion was killed by stone cast from Barad-dûr. As a result, two large kingdoms were left to rule for him alone as Elendil's heir after the war, but Elendil did not try to rule both kingdoms alone either and one can assume it was not wise to do so. A lot of duties had to be done as ruler but also as son and brother. According to the Unfinished Tales chapter Kirion and Eorl, Isildur decided to bury his father at a secret location which we later know as Amon Anwar, the Hill of Awe, or later Halifirien, Holy Mountain in the language of Rohan. The idea was to let no man disturb its peace and silence and I assume the rest of his father. It was the midpoint of the realm of Gondor. Kirion and Eorl will later swear their oaths at this place in the third age when Rohan is founded. This location was considered a hollow place and was a secret among the rulers of Gondor which seems to include the ruling stewards. We know Denethor the second from the Lord of the Rings and Kirion was a ruling steward as well and an ancestor of him. As it was not wise to rule two kingdoms alone, especially considering the distance, Isildur gave the crown of Gondor to Anarion's son Mineldil, who potentially was the last man to be born in Númenor and considering his age could have fought in the war as well. And so the kings of Gondor were now from Anarion's line. Isildur became king of Arnor and as a result the kings of Arnor were from the line of Isildur. He also took the sapling of the white tree he saved in Minas Ithil from Sauron's invasion as we learned in part 2 and planted it in Minas Arnor, later known as Minas Tirith. He also took the shards of Narsil with him. The sapling could have been a while in Rivendell and I speculate further maybe the Palantir of Minas Ithil too. Of course, maybe bows could have been stored in Anuminas as well and just briefly passed through Rivendell but still an interesting thought. Where High King Gil-galad was buried I could not find out. Actually we know very little about what elves did with their dead. The Silmarillion indicates that tombs or burials existed and gives us a few examples. Glorfindel, who we also know from the Lord of the Rings in his re-embodied form, got a cairn in the mountain pass called Kiris Thoronath. 
I assume west of Gondolin. The other would be High King Fingolfin, Galadriel's uncle. He had an impossible to win duel against the first Dark Lord Morgoth, which the king lost, but he could also wound the Dark Lord. Fingolfin's dead body was then rescued from the wrath of Morgoth by Thorondor, the king of the eagles, and brought to Fingolfin's son Turgon, the king of Gondolin, who is also Elrond's great-grandfather by his father's side. Turgon then built a high cairn over him on a mountain top that looked from the north upon the hidden valley of Gondolin. Galadriel's brother Finrod was buried by Beren and Luthien in Tol Sirion, which later foundered under destroying seas when Beleriand was sunk into the ocean. But let us return to the aftermath of the War of the Last Alliance. The elf for sure left Mordor and returned to their lands. I could also not find out where Anarion was buried, maybe close to Elendil's grave or in the tombs of kings in Gondor, for example Ras Dinan if it already existed. I assume the latter or in Osgiliath. I can imagine Elrond and the other elves had a lot to process on their way home. It is hard to say what Elrond felt. In Rivendell he however met Isildur's family again, while Isildur had still things to handle in Gondor and would journey to Rivendell later. Even at this time of recovering and processing, Elrond remained very hospitable it seems and heirs of Isildur growing up there seems to become a thing in the future too. The presence of Isildur's family in Rivendell is an indicator for me why I think the sapling and maybe even the Minas Ithil Palantir were stored there for some time as well. The most precious aspect of life is for sure your close family, your wife, your husband and your children. If Isildur thought they were safe in Rivendell, I don't see a reason why he would think otherwise about the sapling and the seeing stone, though the Palantir might have have been useful for them in the war, so I can see that it was transported somewhere else and the sapling must have been sent to Minas Arnor at some point shortly after the war or even during it as well. Isildur took his three oldest sons with him to the War of the Last Alliance. His oldest son Elendur was even fighting in the siege of Barad-dûr according to the unfinished tales. The other two, Aratharn and Kirion, were later sent to Minas Ithil to guard the passage of Kiris Duas, later called Kiris Ungol, should Sauron try to escape into this direction. So they were not present during the siege of Barad-dûr. Only his youngest son Valandil stayed in Rivendell with his mother. He was only around four years old when the siege of Barad-dûr began. From Elrond's perspective everything changed around the year 3 of the Third Age when two men appeared in Rivendell. One of them was named Ochtar, the other was his companion whose name we don't know. Ochtar was the squire of Isildur. He had the shards of Narsil carried by his companion and ill news. Isildur and his company were ambushed by orcs from the Misty Mountains while crossing the Gladden Fields. Isildur ordered him to flee with Narsil, which must have been a terrible feeling to let your king and companions behind so you can survive. Isildur even mentioned to him, save Narsil from capture by all means that you can find and at all costs, even at the cost of being held a coward who deserted me. Take your companion with you and flee, go, I command you. It's hard to say if it was the right call, but Narsil was saved and stored in Rivendell at least for some time and later in time again or even continuously. It already proved as a safe place to store things of importance. I assume Elrond was back in Rivendell at this time. Sadly we don't know what he thought or said. He advised Isildur to destroy the One Ring, maybe it was not surprising for him that it would bring doom over its bearer. It is now very likely that immediately a small host rode out from Rivendell and maybe Elrond with them as well to help Isildur. We find no information in the text from the Unfinished Tales or somewhere else about Elrond leaving or him sending some else there from Rivendell, but it's in my opinion the only logical step. It seems unreasonable that he would receive these ill news and do nothing. 
The fact that Ochtar escaped with Narsil and reached Rivendell can be found in the chapter The Council of Elrond and in Appendix B of The Lord of the Rings, which makes it very canon in contrast to texts that were work in progress and not published during Tolkien's lifetime. Interestingly, we also can read about other factions trying to help Isildur as well. Quote from the Unfinished Tales. There were rescuers who came on the scene too late, but in time to disturb the orcs and prevent their mutilation of the bodies, for there were certain woodmen who got news to Thranduil by runners and also themselves gathered a force to ambush the orcs. So woodmen of that region, I assume Norsemen, most likely related to the Edain house of Marach and maybe an elven force of Thranduil arrived there too and the remaining orcs who also had heavy casualties from the fight fled. I must assume Elrond or at least those he probably sent appeared there too just later so they could not have prevented the orcs from mutilating the bodies. Why is that detail so important? Because another person survived. A man named Estelmo who was the esquire of Isildur's eldest son Elendur. He was stunned by a club and not slain and was found under Elendur's body. Sadly he was the last survivor. Only three men survived the ambush but he is the source for some of the dialogue and could also prove that Ochtar did not desert but escaped due to the command of Isildur. I guess clearing his name from deserting is one of the few positive things here and might have been important for Ochtar considering how heavy the punishment for that was in many cultures. Ochtar was also most likely not the real name of the squire because it means soldier and was maybe just how Isildur addressed him in this situation and became a name of legend as Tolkien mentioned in the Unfinished Tales The Disaster of the Gladden Fields Note 17. However a few things come together here. The woodmen and Thranduil's forces arrived early and prevented the orcs from potentially killing the last survivor. In the unfinished tales we can also find the headline The Sources of the Legend of Isildur's Death. One of the places with great reputation when it comes to having records of history and law is Rivendell and we know for a fact that the only survivors who could flee went directly to Rivendell. Though the disaster of the Gladden Fields happened 3rd age 2 and Ochtar arrives in Rivendell 3rd age 3 which is strange. Isildur started his journey in September and expected to reach Elrond's realm in October, maybe early November. Why would Ochtar and his companion need so long to get there? I guess he had to hide a bit. His task was to protect Nar Thiel, not to call for help. As a result it seems very plausible that Rivendell sent people there and also recorded the incident in detail. Elrond is one of the great lawmasters. Another great lawmaster is Pengolos from Gondolin though he only appears in work in progress texts and left Middle Earth in the second age. And to master law you must also record it. I think here we have another example after the events of the second age which Elrond witnessed as well where law was recorded. It it is possible that Elrond knew Pengolov who interestingly dwelt in Khazad Doom for a while. Elves and men probably searched intensively for Isildur who during the ambush and ongoing fight also tried to escape with a heavy heart. Isildur even used the one ring but it led to his death. His body could not be found and neither the one ring which has brought doom over the king. It was for sure hard to foresee that such a small thing could be the source of so much evil but it called upon Sauron's servants. In one version of the unfinished tales we can read that he used the one ring so he could not be seen, so he thought, and fled over 34 kilometers or 21 miles, I can't say how long it took him. When he reached the river Anduin he cast off his armor and most weapons he still had with him except a short stabbing sword, so called Iket, and tried to swim to the other side of the Anduin. In the water the one ring betrayed him and slipped off his finger and was lost for a long time as we know. 
When Isildur came out of the water, the orcs could see him though. The Elendilmir or Star of Elendil, the in part 2 mentioned gem from Numinor he wore as King of Arnor, started to glow red when he used the one ring, I assume he did not know, and all could see a flying red eye in the dark, I imagine. As a result he was not fully invisible while wearing the one ring, but the glow put all who saw it into fear. Though he did not have the one ring anymore, on the other side, the Elendilmir still glowed red for a bit it seems and in fear of what kind of monster has crept out of the water, the orcs on the other side of the river shot their poisoned arrows in fear at him and fled. Isildur's heart and throat were hit and he fell into the water. His body was never found by elves or men. This story was for the most part unknown to most people though. It must be noted that this is a version from the unfinished tales and as we discussed before, canon is always debatable outside of sources published during Tolkien's lifetime like the Lord of the Rings, though the texts were written by John Ronald Rule Tolkien as well, but are originally unpublished work in progress texts that were only published after Tolkien's death. Even canon for the Silmarillion is often debated. The Silmarillion version of this event is also slightly different in some details. For example, when Isildur swam and lost the one ring in the water, we can read, Then the orcs saw him as he labored in the stream and they shot him with many arrows. That is also what we see in the film but of course contradicts the version from the unfinished tales which also might be newer and in Lord of the Rings a lot of these details are missing completely. In the Silmarillion and Lord of the Rings version the glowing Elendilmir is not mentioned at all in this context though Ochtar and that three people survived in total is mentioned in both works as well. Of course nobody really saw what happened to Isildur so it makes sense that there are different versions. What I like is how Tolkien places all these details to explain certain things in the text from the unfinished tales. For example Isildur casting off his armor which was most likely found was a hint that he must have tried to swim to the other side of the Anduin. Maybe they also found an orc arrow stuck somewhere in a tree and a bit of blood at the other side of the river which would help construct what happened further. Still Isildur's body was never found by elves or men, neither the one ring. Only the chain of the one ring and the Elendilmir were found much later by Saruman according to another text from the unfinished tales. And he potentially also found Isildur's remains too, but he never told anyone. Overall these information were not widely known, especially not in Gondor and kept almost like a secret of the Norse it seems. Quote from Elrond, only to the Norse did these tidings come and only to a few. This might have been the case because Elrond sent people there to help or was there himself, not men of Gondor. According to the Silmarillion Elrond also made a prophecy in Rivendell regarding the shards of Narsil and its reforging. Quote, and Master Elrond foretold that this reforging Narsil would not be done until the ruling ring should be found again and Sauron should return, but the hope of elves and men was that these things might never come to pass. Another interesting detail is the question, where did those orcs that ambushed Isildur come from? We can read that Isildur felt victorious with all his enemies defeated and did not expect an ambush and was only traveling with around 200 knights and soldiers. According to note 20 of the chapter The Disaster of the Gladden Fields in the Unfinished Tales, Sauron sent orcs from Mordor to the Misty Mountains and surroundings to ambush advancing hosts of Sauron's enemies and diminishing their numbers before they could reach Mordor or stop reinforcements at the end of the second age. The host of the last alliance was so huge though that they would not dare to attack. Even when Thranduil returned and we know only a third of his army returned while the rest died, it still was too much a threat to attack for those orc troops hiding 
living in the mountains and forests, though we can read the outnumbered Isildur's men by maybe up to 10 to 1, but this number could be exaggerated. However, those troops stayed alerted and likely did not know about Sauron's defeat yet. It was then when Isildur returned to Rivendell they saw their chance and Tolkien also mentions that the One Ring called upon Sauron's servants. If the Dúnedain, Elrond, the Woodmen and Thranduil's elves could have guessed this is hard to say but they for sure asked themselves where those orcs came from as well. In this terrible fight in the Gladden Fields, the three eldest sons of Isildur died, but his youngest son Valandil was not with them. He was safe in Rivendell with his mother. The poor boy was just 13 to 14 when his father and three elder brothers died. When he was 21, he became king of Aranor, third age 10. With him living in Rivendell when he was young and growing up there, one could say a tradition began that should be continued later. Also after this tragic and disastrous event known as the disaster of the Gladden Fields and Sauron still hiding in the Far East, Middle-earth would have a time of peace. Well deserved one could say. In this time Elrond also seems to see better times for himself as well, but this we will discuss in part 4. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and that I could bring you some new details and ideas of the disaster of the Gladden Fields that you don't find in other lore content, especially Elrond's role and perspective are quite interesting here. You for sure also noticed that the part is now shorter but it's more pleasant to produce for me in this form. As said I plan to upload an all in one version of epic length when all is done as well. It will take some parts until we are through the third age though. If you liked this video please feel free to press the like button, leave a comment and let me know your opinion. Maybe press the subscribe button and consider pressing the stupid bell. I also have playlists with my best law videos linked in the description and maybe recommend me to others interested in Tolkien. Next on my channel might be another law Q&A stream on YouTube. If news pop up I might cover those. I also have some ideas for some other smaller law videos as well and after the Who is Elrond project is finished I try to work on another bigger law video. On top of that I also stream on Twitch and maybe produce more content for the gaming channel. So a lot of content is planned. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.